Okay, good morning. This is Richard Shu, host of Shu Untied. Uh, this morning, I'm really thrilled and honored to welcome an old colleague, former colleague of mine, Jennifer Liu, who's now the Chief Legal Officer of Pokemon. Jennifer, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Richard. I'm <laughs> still Jennifer, delighted yeah, to be here. Yeah, and it's great to see you. I know it's been a long, long time since we worked together at Townsend, but it's great to see you. It's been a minute. <laughs> oh, a little more than that. Well, let me start by asking you, because um, everybody's slightly different, why you went to law school in the first place? Well, I started the way many Asian American kids do in college, studying a handful of sciences. So I started in cellular molecular biology, and then I moved to have a concentration in computer science. And somewhere along the way, I got involved with our uh, Asian American uh, activist organization at the University of Michigan. It was called the University of Michigan Asian Student Coalition. And it was uh, my work with that group that actually ended up uh, getting me over to law school. Because mm -hmm. what happened was we had a dispute with the university. Um, there was a, um, an event at a fraternity where a group of our cohort went and they experienced some racial slurs mm -hmm. at the frat. Hmm. And our group engaged in mediation uh, that was brokered by the University of Michigan Ombudsman. Hmm. And so they organized a mediation between our group and the fraternity. And I remember sitting in that mediation and thinking to myself, I'm getting rings run around me at this moment. And I don't like that feeling. And uh, it was my gone with the wind moment as God is my witness, this isn't going to happen again. <laughs> and <laughs> right after that, I ended up chucking the science huh. and signing up for law school. Was that a hard decision or not Not too hard? Not that hard. <laughs> and, well. and what did you, what did you think of law school when you got there? Did you, did you like it a lot or were you? Okay, at, the risk of sound, at the risk of sounding like a complete tool, I loved law school. <laughs> That's okay. There are people who love law school. I think that. I, I think don't that even works. think kids today know what it means when they when you say I was a complete tool. I was not a complete tool, but I loved law school. Yeah, yeah. Because what did you I, What did you What did you like about it? Just the intellectual challenge. The, the the because it was very different. Did you like it because it was so different from what you had done before? Because people like it for different reasons. Yeah. So. Um, of course, the first class we had was a property law class, and I don't know if. Uh, new law school entrance study this case today, but the first case was, of course, Pearson versus Post, which yeah, was <laughs> two people crossing some line on some property line on a beach chasing a fox. And uh, I sat through that and thought, dang, this really beats sitting in uh, sitting in the computer center at two in the morning trying to debug my code on a Unix mainframe, <laughs> which is what I've been doing before. <laughs> <laughs> I can I, I can totally rate. I was an undergrad engineer and I spent countless hours in a windowless basement programming assembly language. And you're right. It that is not that that's not that fun. I'd probably still be there if I was trying to be a computer trying to solve that. <laughs> Seriously. I did miss the fortune the card punching phase. So we were already I was programming in basic and then of course Pascal, Pas C, yeah, yeah, C plus. Yeah. But you know, still debugging your code on the mainframe at two in the morning. Not so fun. <laughs> Well, how and did I you? That was I was not that great a coder, so uh, yeah, um, so yeah. going to law school and and hearing about people's problems and trying to come up with um, solutions uh, was really fun. Well, actually. so how did you kind of migrate? I mean, obviously you went to law school. You didn't. I assume you didn't know exactly what kind of lawyer you wanted to be. You somehow migrated into the world of intellectual property. Tell me a little about how that happened. Uh, well, my first job was actually at a large litigation shop. Um, mm -hmm. It was Heller, Ehrman, White & McAuliffe, which is mm -hmm. no longer in San Francisco, but was a San Francisco-based, mainly litig litigation firm, although they were full service. Yep. So um, I ended up going into general litigation. And as with a lot of those large firms, you can end up working on a single case for a really long time. Um, I had one mainstay case that had been running for, I think, I think 20 years by yeah. the time I got in there. Yeah. It was a complex fraud case. Insurance was involved. A lot of insurance was involved because it was a um, a product uh, liability case that had gone on for years. And of course the damage that had been done 
um, had continued over several decades. And so many, many insurance policies mm. responded or arguably responded mm. uh, to, to the incident. So I spent a good chunk of my time doing complex litigation, which mm. is really does, you know, in the big firms having um, an experience like that teaches you the mechanics, yeah. you know, gives you a really good foundation for um, the exercise of law. And of course, it's only litigation, and there's many, many kinds of law, but it does teach you the rigor and it does teach you the technical, it gives you the technical skill base. Mm -hmm. So um, after that, after being at Heller for about four and a half years or so, um, intellectual property was hot and interesting. And if you've done, uh, you know, a fraud or contracts case, it, it feels very useful, but mm -hmm. at the same time, not particularly keyed into the times or the environment. And at that time, patent litigation was hot um, into us, what we used to call at the time, soft intellectual property, copyrights and trademarks were just fun and interesting because they really involved people's creativity. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I came to Townsend, as you probably know, in 1996 and started working right away on mainly soft IP cases to begin with. I developed a preliminary injunction practice for folks who were infringing copyrights and trademarks under Joel Linsner, who you'll recall is oh, yeah. one of our good colleagues um, and my mentor. And uh, then did a smattering of patent litigation. Um, I had some, I was blessed to have some wonderful clients when I was at Townsend. I mm -hmm. had um, this will make the young people laugh, but I had Yahoo as one of my primary clients, Visa, um, Apple, and Sony. Mm, well, those were great. So clients. they were, it was a wonderful, a wonderful book of clients to be working with. So I got very lucky. So what, tell me about the siren call to pull you in house. Is that something you'd always wanted to do? Is that something you, an interest you developed while you were there? Or was this something that you were not expecting or interested in? I was much more torn about my move in-house, and it was largely Joel Linsner, um, mm -hmm. who, I don't know if Joel's actually retired yet. <laughs> He's been, he had been the executive vice president of Electronic Arts for, mm -hmm. since, I can tell you the date, since April 30th of 1999, which is when he left Townsend. <laughs> um, and he, I met with him, I had had an offer to go in-house at uh, Sony Computer Entertainment America was the name of the company at the time. Sure. That was the division of Sony that handled all the PlayStation um, business in the Americas. And I told Joel that I had the offer because he was a mentor. And he said, you should think seriously about taking it. Hmm. He said, think where you are now. You're a partner at a law firm. He said, it doesn't get easier. Mm -hmm. So, And he was very, very straight with me. Hmm. But I was torn about it. Because yeah. I was, I was worried at the time. You know, in-house counsel jobs, as you know, has have changed a lot mm -hmm. over the course of three or four decades. And I remember when I was um, coming up through the ranks in the law firms, um, going in-house didn't have a great reputation. Mm -hmm. you didn't have a good reputation for um, working with the best people. You had there were there was a reputation for clients who weren't particularly legally educated and weren't very sophisticated. I mean, that was how it was in, in the mid to late 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I didn't I didn't really think about it seriously. And I was really worried about losing my edge. <laughs> what, 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 what was it that really pushed you over? The, what made you decide to take that leap? It sounds like you were really equivocating over. But what finally pushed you to make well, the I always. I just, you know, the question I always ask myself is, what's the worst thing that can happen? Mm -hmm. Right. It's and I think that takes a lot of pressure off of um, especially a young or aspiring lawyer, which is think about it. How bad is it going to be? Can you reverse this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need to. And of course, my feeling was it's completely reversible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought at that time, let me go and let me see how it is. Um, I was the part that was intriguing about it was learning more about my client. Mm. So litigation is an incredible window into learning about the company that you're representing. True. Because when you defend depositions, you learn a 
thoughts, <laughs> not just about the executive or the the witness that you are defending, but you you learn a lot about how the company is structured. Yeah. And it's a free pass to ask them anything about their business, about the company organization, about how departments work with each other. It is it's carte blanche, mm. and it's. It's really lovely. So you learn a lot. Mm. On the other hand, you're not involved in a lot because you've really been hired to do one job, and that is to make sure the company exits uh, the particular dispute well. So how did you like it when you went there? Because some people, you know, in-house is not for everyone. Some people love it. Other people really like private practice. I mean, obviously, it sounds like you had a great private practice, but what did you, did you really like the in-house right away? Did it take a while to get used to it? It did not take me very long to get used to it. It was, I had an easy transition. Um, mm -hmm. Sony Computer Entertainment America was actually a plaintiff <laughs> for, well, we were the plaintiff on our IP infringement cases on the small ones, you know, kind of what we would call the anti-piracy cases. Mm -hmm. But these were large uh, mm -hmm. copyright cases mm -hmm. and they were, one of them was still ongoing when I went in-house. So I had a soft transition. I was running the litigation, only running it from inside the company as opposed to from the law firm. So that was about a year um, before that case resolved. And then I started slowly gathering more responsibilities beyond litigation. I started taking on the third party licensing um, area, which is uh, managing all the legal support for all the public game publishers who want to be on the PlayStation platform. So that was, I, start, I just started moving into more and more areas then in 2005, uh, we were preparing to launch the PlayStation Network, which of course is gigantic today, but at that time we were putting together the legal framework for that. So I got tasked with that and that was really, that really was an opportunity to conduct interdisciplinary hmm. uh, examinations and to understand how the entire business fit together because we, the company had never been a retailer before hmm. and so that was its first foray. When you took that job at Sony, you'd obviously been spending a lot of time there. Did you have an idea of how long you were going to stay there? Did you think you would stay as long as you did? Or what was your plan? No. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to that, uh, you know, my stints, I'd been four years at Heller and then four years at Townsend. And I think the first time I looked up and looked at the the calendar at Sony, I was 10 years in and I was like, oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did not realize that that much time had gone by. We used to call it Sony time, but now I know what it is, is it's in-house counsel time. That, what did, that's, how, that's how, it, how was it working for a Japanese company being in America? I mean, obviously, I mean, was that a cultural challenge? Was that something you were used to? Tell me a little bit about, about that. Not at all at Sony. They're very, for a Japanese company, they're quite forward thinking. Mm. And um, that was, it, that part was not an adjustment at all. Mm -hmm. and no issues they're an extremely respectful company they've been you know dealing with they've had american ceos in their subsidiaries american and british and welsh <laughs> so they're very used to having um american leadership what about the game what about the gaming industry do you sound like you obviously work with them as a client you knew something about it but obviously you had to get a lot deeper into that space is that is that something you you know really enjoy do you like playing games yourself i mean tell me a little about I that do. i do although i grew up so the 3d game console generation came when i was just out of law school so <laughs> i didn't have a lot of time to console game but you know, I grew up playing arcade games. Okay. So, and would sneak out in the evenings and go down to Woodward Avenue in, in Detroit and find the arcades there and, you know, the couple rolls of quarters. It was really back in the day. But yeah, I enjoy the, I enjoy the interface. Um, I enjoy the gaming. I enjoy gaming design. Hmm. Um, I just, I find it, it's a, it's a wonderful industry to work for. It's a very creative industry. And it's uh, very distinct from the other sort of pillar creative industries, which are, you know, linear media like film and music. Very, very it, different. It sounds like over the time at Sony, you obviously transitioned or uh, obviously started doing more transactional work. Do you still, how do you like transactional work versus litigation? Do you still enjoy the litigation more? Or at this point, you're mostly transactional? Or tell me a little about the mix of that now. Um, well, now overseeing, I try not to, 
get too much into the weeds with anything. So, but transactional work is quite satisfying. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you can, you, and, and having a litigation background is really helpful when you are going into transactions because you appreciate the end, where the, where it all ends up. Yeah. And so creating and drafting language with a knowledge of how these te- the, ter- certain phrases tend to get resolved or argued over is extremely helpful and for a while you know my my feeling was i don't i don't when i go to hire a transactional lawyer which is fairly you know fair doesn't happen that often these days because my teams would will typically do that but if i'm hiring a transactional lawyer i don't consider you know a drop of litigation experience a bad thing at all yeah yeah very positive do you now looking back do you think you should just start off as a transactional lawyer or you think you it was good that you had litigation background Excellent to have the litigation background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell me, t- tell me a little about how the Pokemon opportunity came up. It sounds wonderfully exciting. Uh, <laughs> that is, were you were you looking to stay in the gaming industry? Or, no, or was I was it, looking you... to retire. I was supposed <laughs> to be retired in January of 2020. That was the plan. I did. I did take a lovely trip to Switzerland in February of 2020, and it was kind of like a zombie movie because I, we started to hear. I was uh, skiing with very good friends who are uh, who had a place in Switzerland and we were on the Swiss French border and we started to hear like five days into the trip we heard the story about these British um, these British visitors or British travelers being airlifted out of a French resort in the Alps and it was it was like that move the beginning of Dawn of the Dead right where you see so, you don't really quite put it together you're not quite sure what's happening and but people were actually getting lifted out and flown back to England and um, you know, I left Switzerland three days later and I didn't realize I was racing, uh, you know, racing COVID out of Europe. Right. Um, but then got back uh, in late February and a month later, everything shut down. Wow. So all the plans to eat, pray, love, go to Spanish <laughs> yoga retreats and, you know, <laughs> oh meditate in Thailand, all of that was off the boards. Oh my so, um, but so I did a lot of exploration of San Francisco, which was great because, you know, working as a lawyer for the 30 years prior was not, uh, didn't give me a lot of opportunity to explore that amazing city. Yeah, it's a wonderful yeah. city. Yeah. I, I mean, I found places in San Francisco during those nine months in 2020 that I never had seen before. So <laughs> it's a really amazing city. There's a lot in there. Yeah. And, um, but I think it was towards the end of August. I um, I belong to a women women's general council network, and one of the founders of that network, the inimitable Jan Kong, um, was looking for a software uh, engineer. And I know happen to know a crackerjack software engineer, mm-hmm. so I wanted to hook the two of them up on LinkedIn, but had not. I really don't use social media that much or as much as perhaps I should. So yeah. I hadn't even updated my LinkedIn profile. But I thought if I'm going to hook my friends up on LinkedIn, I should probably correct my profile. Mm-hmm. So I went in and all I did was I changed one word in the LinkedIn profile. So it had said global or worldwide general counsel for Sony Interactive Entertainment. And I put formerly. <laughs> That's the only word I changed. And less than a week later, I got a call from a headhunter. Wow. <laughs> It wasn't you, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> but I got a call from a headhunter and it was quite funny. She and I are quite good friends now. And she said, but she said somewhat accusatorily, nobody even knows you left Sony. Why didn't you change your pro? <laughs> and I said, I just didn't even think about it. I was supposed to be retired. So. Well, what, what, um, what lured you out of retirement? I mean, you had all these great plans to do yoga retreats in Thailand and stuff. What, what what's lured happening you in 2020? I guess that's true. I guess so. So yeah. you thought, well, if I can't do that, then I might as well go back to work or it what really was... wasn't, it really wasn't like that. She's, um, she's uh, the headhunter is, was extremely, and she still is extremely persuasive. What she said was, oh, you could really help them. They're, you know, they're looking, they're growing. The business is booming. They're looking to grow their legal department and scale it. And you've done that. You've worked for a Japanese multinational before. So um, I just think you could help them, which, you know, if you're in the service industry, that kind of hits you in the heart, right? Like they need help and you could help. And, And she said, you just 
just talk to them. You don't have to, you can withdraw your name if you don't think you want to stay in the process. <laughs> just talk to them. I bet you've said that to a couple of your can <laughs> reluctant candidates before, Richard. So, so I did. I talked to the executive team and, you know, by December I was on payroll. Wow, amazing. So how's it been so far? Has it been, is it, well, I know you had the COVID and I know now recently now you're going back in force, but I mean, is it totally different from Sony? Is it, you know? Oh, it's totally I, different. Yeah. Totally yeah. different. Yeah. You know, first of all, it's a different stage. Mm. Um, it And and I think the circumstances, that there are similarities, you know, when companies are starting smaller, they're sort of in their, sort of in their small to mid size movement. Um, but TPCI puts an enormous, I think um, our leadership understands quite uniquely, I think, um, how important this pivot point is mm -hmm. as the company is starting to really increase its reach. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, this is a really critical time uh, to define leadership and to define culture. Mm -hmm. Incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Sony was moving so fast at the moment, um, and it was a different time. I mean, this is 1994 to 1998, mm. and it's a different world now. Our workforce looks different. Yeah. The expectations are different. The pandemic has disrupted workforces in a way that's way different than it was in the late 90s. So, um, so management's approach to um, taking care and looking after its culture and its community within its four walls is really, there's a lot more attention mm -hmm. given now to that. Mm -hmm. Are you having fun? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's one thing that's really unique about this company is that, and I was just kind of, these, these were my shower thoughts yesterday. Is one of the things that makes this company super special is that without even saying so, yeah. the culture seems to have been formed by a workforce that every individual member wants to learn. Hmm genuinely interested in the learning yeah. and that part of it is pokemon itself yeah. i mean the actual the actual interface and what you do is all about learning in the game it's yeah. community yeah. it's coming together but it's a very strategic game mm -hmm. so i think it's it, it tends to attract a certain type of workforce and that part's been really wonderful before you joined the company did had you played pokemon how much did you know about it not that much, you know, a little bit of Pokemon Go. Uh -huh. Okay. That was really it. Yeah. But well, like I said, the, the, the three, the console generation had passed me by <laughs> at the time when, cause I had just come out of law school. So. Well, I remember when the Pokemon Go thing was crazy. Remember that was like, was it, anyways, it was a while ago, but there was that craze when everyone was playing it and stuff like that. So. Yeah. That was, I think it launched in 2016. Okay. And yeah. That sounds about that right. Was, yeah. That was a uh, definite rejuvenation. Yeah. or interest in Pokemon. Well, I'm but, sure you know, I'm sure you've learned a lot more about it since you joined that company. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our one of our core values is passion for Pokemon. <laughs> so since you have since you came from Asian family, what do your parents think? You didn't go to science. Were they disappointed you decided to choose law? What do they think now? They were never disappointed by my choices, but there was a point in time when after I said I'm going to law, their first reaction was because they're both in the medical field. Oh. Uh, my father's passed, but they were both in the medical field. My mother's still alive. Yeah. And their reaction was, but we can't help you. And I said, I don't want your help. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be uh, ungrateful, but I, it's okay. So that was, that was their first reaction. And then my dad, who had a very dry wit, his second reaction was, if you become an ambulance chaser, I'm going to disown you. <laughs> <laughs> Since he was in the medical field. <laughs> so they they did not have any issue with my choice at all. They've always um, said, you need to do something. It's your life. You need to do something that you want to do, yes. which um, was a refreshing attitude, frankly, um, from uh, Asian American, uh, Asian immigrants. Yeah, Both totally. my parents were immigrants. Totally. Well, Jennifer, it's been wonderful chatting with you and catching up with you and hearing about your, your incredible career. If you do decide to do something else, which I can't imagine, but if you do, please come back and tell me about it. Actually, I'm interviewing retirees now to see what the next <laughs> chapter looks like. So, thank you, but I'll let you know, Richard. This is Richard Shu and Jennifer Liu. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.